God's preparing us for something. I've been talking about four directives for 2021. The first one was, you can weather any storm or test when you align your thoughts, values, and lifestyle with God and his word. Focus on the kingdom of God this year. Jesus said the kingdom of God's inside, right? <laughs> and see, when the presence come, it stirs you up inside. You feel stirred up right now inside? See, it, you feel it inside. Something's grabbing your heart. Yeah, that's right. Verse number two, this year, I mentioned this last week, you're going to have to choose whether to stay at home or come and help us promote the kingdom of God and train new, new believers. How many hear me? Choices. We've got to make choices. God, God cannot manifest when we stay in isolation. And that's the reason the enemy has sought to mess up God's plan in 2020. But you know what? You can't keep God down. You push him away, he keeps find, finding ways to draw himself closer. Best thing you'll ever do, turn off the news. Turn on the word. And then be, be willing to be challenged for what you believe. If you're still listening to the news, you're just, I don't know, I could use several adjectives. And let me just, listen here, I'm 62 years old. I've said this many times. I remember when I was a young boy, the Iron Curtain separated the communist world from the rest. You couldn't travel over there. And those were beleaguered people, 1992, three. I went for the first time to Leopaya, Latvia. Those people had been heretofore under communism. I had to go via Moscow to get there. And I saw the after effects of communism. And when I was a little boy, those that are in the know, the adults told me, said, you see that? And, you know, they'd show broadcasts from China, broadcasts, news broadcasts from from, uh, Russia. And they say, see, they're they're just mouthing propaganda to their people so they can keep them bound. See, I remember that as a kid. I was five years old, six years old. And now we have it here. Now, some people don't believe. Some people laugh at me when I say that. You can laugh all you want. I'm good with laughing. Laugh some more. There's a twist. Best thing you'll do is turn the news off. I'm not kidding you. I mean what I say. You know what? You know what? A new, listen, a new level of the peace of God came on me when I stopped looking at the news. Well, then you got your head in the sand. No, I've got my head out of that twisted propaganda. Number three. There's enough of that. Now, this is going to have two parts. I'm not kidding. I sat down yesterday's study. In five seconds, he gave me something else. Added to it. So number three, the Holy Spirit manifests in unity, not in isolation. Now let me say this. This is in my notes, but I'm going to stop here a minute and share a story. There is coming and now we are entering into a great moving of the Holy Spirit. Now the next sentence, it it will be unprecedented in our time. So let me tell you a story. When I was young, I, I came to Jesus when I was 18. And that was in 1976. And then the ensuing years of the 70s, you know, at the Bible school in my hometown. Then Susan and I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. We attended Kenneth Hagin School, Rama, And it was all fresh and new at the time. And, I mean, there were people from all over the country that were just flocking to Tulsa. And ORU was was doing real well. And and, and, um, uh, Billy Joe Darty at uh, Victory uh, Christian Center had a, had a school as well. All that was just raging in, in Tulsa. And uh, there were some large ministries that came out of Tulsa. T.L. Osborne, which was a tremendous man of God, has his ministry in Tulsa. And it was just a raging place. And so we got pretty stirred up. But while I was there, um, one of my friends, I, I think he worked on the Raymond, worked for Kenneth Hagin Ministries, gave me a cassette tape at the time. And let me just tell you how you do this. You've got to keep your fire stoked. How many hear me? You know, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 
Stir up the gift of God which is in you. It was placed in you by the laying on of my hands. Stir up uh, um, one of the older men of God. It's not, it might have been D.L. Moody. The, the uh, tendency of fire is to go out. And he said, stir the fire on the altar of your heart. And then he said, you know, you got to use those bellows. You got to throw, throw a little more fire, a little more f- fuel on the fire, some fresh wood. And then sometimes you've got to stoke the fire, put the stoker in there and stir it up, stir the ashes. And, and, then, and then you've just got to tend the fire. And that's what he said, tend the fire. Well, let me tell you one way I tended the fire on the altar of my heart. Anything that would connect me to the Lord and move me uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, I'd listen to it. So I had certain cassette tapes that I listened to over and over. For instance, in 1978, uh, Kenneth Hagin did a series uh, on the Rama campus called How You Can Be Led by the Spirit of God. And somebody gave me tape five. Now, tape five, at the very end, I'm telling this for a reason, at the very end of the cassette tape, the Holy Spirit fell in the room. <laughs> and the power of God came on Brother Hagen, and, I, and, and you could hear it, and, and you could hear the room light up. Y'all, I would, you know, then you had to re, re, rewind and then fast forward. I'd place, I'd hit the rewind, and then I'd listen to it. It was about, you know, 10 minutes or so of that, and then I'd rewind it again and hit play and, and, and then do it all over again. And I'd listen to it over and over. When I got dry, I said, I got to hear that again. I got stoked to fire. Hear me? So somebody gave me another cassette tape and I listened to that I, for, for, for a decade or more into the eighties. I mean, I listened to that. Lord have mercy. And then uh, we were in Tulsa. I never even told Susan this. I don't think. You've probably heard me listen to it. Anyway, uh, Kenneth Hagen uh, was in John Osteen's church, Lakewood Church. Now, I see this front of the cassette tape, January 18th, 1979. And I don't even, well, you know what? Uh, he got up to preach. And he had a prophet's ministry. Now, I'm saying this for a reason because he gets right into my message. We'll see how long we get to go today. He got up to preach and uh, the Raymer singers and band were singing, soon and very soon we're going to see the king. It was a popular song back in the 70s. Soon and very soon we're going to see the king. And he, while he was sitting there on the platform before he got up to preach, because he had a prophet's ministry, he saw into the spirit realm and had discerning of spirits and saw two angels flying over the big auditorium. It's not like Lakewood Church today, smaller church, first one. Uh, flying over, and he saw one angel, talk, and he said this on the cassette tape. I, I did this one, fast, and you know, rewind, play, rewind, play. I did it all through the 80s, and probably into the 90s, and then we got CDs, whatever. And, and he saw two angels, and one angel looked at the other one and said, what will happen in the end time? He saw them. They were flying around, around, around. What will happen in the end time, one angel said to the other. What will happen to the earth? And the other angel answered, and Kenneth Hagin said he heard it. He said, well, I don't know. God knows, the angel said to the other one. But sometimes he gives information to men. And then Kenneth Hagin started and said, the word of the Lord came unto me immediately. The Holy Spirit came on him. And here's what he said, there shall come Hang on. a mighty move of the Spirit of God just before Jesus comes back. And he went on and on the whole tape talking about the moving of the Spirit. Lester Sumrall, I heard him preach many times in person because he would come to Tulsa. And he was friends with Smith Wigglesworth. And Smith Wigglesworth saw a vision of the end time harvest. He's got it in his books. Lester Sumrall died in 1996. And he again said, Lester Sumrall said, in the end time, there's a tremendous move of the Spirit of God that will eclipse everything God's ever done in the whole church age. And y'all, we are wading right into it right now. I always wondered when and how, and now we are going to get the privilege of seeing it. I want to give you 
as long as the Lord will let me. The scriptural background for a move of the Spirit. A lot of churches are as dry as my yard on a hundred degree day. Or when I was a little boy and it was dry, we'd live down a dirt road. I never could keep my car clean because the dust on the road would fly up and I'd have to wipe it off. All that's white. My first car was white. A lot of churches are just dry. Y'all, it's time to be wet with the dew of heaven. And it's time to allow the Holy Spirit to manifest himself. No longer will it be just preaching and teaching and singing. No, it's pursuing the presence of God. See the difference? When you pursue a person, that person brings who he is into your life. And then it's not selfish. Then when he touches you, he'll want you to reach others. So I want to share some things. Now, there's metaphors. One thing you'll find out about the Lord, there is metaphors and symbolism. He uses metaphors and symbols to speak to us because he tries to relate to us where we live And a lot in the Bible, you have a lot of um, agrarian metaphors, agrarian symbolism, because they live close to the land. It wasn't an industrial age. We live in the industrial age. But they live close to the land, so they understood relationships with animals and and the land. And and, and they needed rain, and they planted crops, and and all the animal husbandry. So there's a lot of that in the Scriptures. And if you're a farmer, if you plant a, a garden, or if you just want to keep your yard green, you know that there is no harvest without water. Yes or no? So I want to direct your attention to John chapter 7. Jesus here, and I've got to explain this. There's so much here. John seven thirty seven. on that last day, this is New King James, on the last day, now I'll explain this in a minute, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. By this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. There were two Jewish feasts that were aligned with the harvest season in Israel. Uh, there in the Middle East, the first one was the Feast of Pentecost. It was uh, in May. It was in May, our, our May. Uh, Pentecost means 50. So it was 50 days after the Jewish Feast of Passover, which is a tremendous symbol of Jesus, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. world. Uh, the Israelites slew the, the Passover lamb just before they left Egypt, and they were set free from bondage, just like Jesus sets us free from bondage because he is the Lamb of God. Isn't that good? Then 50 days later, you got the Feast of uh, Pentecost. Now, the Feast of Pentecost, listen, was associated with spring, the spring grain or wheat harvest. So see, these, a lot of these feasts, these two feasts I want to talk about now are associated with harvest. Everybody say harvest. How many know God's concerned about people that don't know Him? So when they come to Jesus, we call it the harvest. That's what the Bible calls a harvest. And so when they, when they reap the wheat harvest, the grain harvest, they needed uh, the rains and they called them latter rains. Everybody say latter rains. And they knew if they had the latter rains during that harvest or just prior to that harvest season, they would have a bumper crop and that's what they were looking for. And that means they would be blessed the rest of the year. And then there was the Feast of, of Tabernacles or the Feast of Ingathering, or it was the Feast of Shelters. Different translations of the Bible uh, show it different ways. And different places of the Bible call it different things. But the Feast of Tabernacles was in the fall of the year. (laughs) Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is associated with the second coming of Christ. It's kind of interesting. Anyway, Feast of Tabernacles, or it was called the Feast of Ingathering. And in this feast, they gathered the, the uh, olives for olive oil and then the grapes to make wine, okay? Um, which is nothing like the wine you drink today, not nearly as fermented. Yeah, I don't want to get into all that. But anyway, uh, it was a, this Feast of Tabernacles, again, was associated with a harvest of oil and wine in the autumn of the year. And, and so it's called early rains. Early rains preceded this 
harvest. So you got the latter rains in our May and then and then the early rains. I want to say it sounds strange. It ought to be early the early part of the year, but that's not the way it works. These these latter in the autumn, these these rains were called early rains, and that's what that's what they called them now. Now here's Jesus on the last day, the great day of the feast. Now that's Feast of Tabernacles. Now what's significant? Listen, listen, everybody listening? What's it? <laughs> this is amazing. On this same day, he called it the last day, the great day, the last day of the feast. They had a ceremony I'll tell you about in a minute. But let me give you the, the background that the Jews during Jesus' time knew. During the last day of this feast of ingathering, feast of booths, feast of tabernacles, during that day is the day that Solomon's temple was dedicated. 1 Kings 8, 2. All the men of Israel assembled before King Solomon at the annual Feast of Shelters. It calls it Feast of Shelters here. It's Feast of Tabernacles. Which was held in early autumn in the month of Ethanim. Then it tells what happened on that day when they were dedicating Solomon's temple. On that day. 1 Kings 8, 10. When the priest came out of the holy place, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priest could not continue their service because of the cloud for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. That's awesome. The presence of God would manifest as a cloud by day to hide the sun from the Israelites as they journeyed through the wilderness. And then a, a pillar of fire by night, and it would hover over the tabernacle. They had a temporary tent they would make and put the Ark of the Covenant there, and the presence of God would come. When they built Solomon's temple, that same, that same cloud filled the temple as they began to worship. Isn't that awesome? And Kenneth Hagin's ministry, because he had a prophetic anointing, we would often be in meetings and he would say, there's the cloud. And y'all, I mean, you, you, you could feel the atmosphere. You could almost cut it out with a knife, it seemed. Take you a chunk, put it in your pocket, and take it home. It was that thick. Nobody wanted to move uh, as he began to teach and minister under the anointing. And it would just affect you. I can't describe how the presence affects us. See, we're made, how many hear me, for the presence of God. So anyway, when Jesus stood up on the last day, the great day of the feast, that's the background. This is the day the glory of God fell in Solomon's temple, and the Jews knew that. So let's go back, fast forward back to Jesus. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, let me explain that. There was a ceremony on this last day of the feast called outpouring of waters. Everybody say outpouring of waters. And, and, and they, they, they did this every time they had this feast of tabernacles, very last day. And what would happen was the priest would take water from the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. Everybody say scent. Now, 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 the water from the pool of Siloam came from Gihon Springs. Everybody say Gihon Springs. Gihon means, it means bursting forth. You just got to know that. And so the priest would take the water from scent. The water came from <laughs> bursting forth. And then he'd go over to the altar and pour it on the altar. And then he would quote Isaiah 12, 3. Therefore with joy shall you draw waters out of the wells, wells of salvation. Whew! Now, now the Jews knew that. And that's the background for Jesus saying what he said on the last day. The great day of the feast. Jesus stood and cried out, here's the, here's the priest pouring the water on the altar from the pool Siloam. And the water came from Gihon Springs bursting forth. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You get it now? A little bit more significant, would you say? And then it makes sense. You say, now, why did he change? He didn't change the subject. 
John didn't change the subject. The Holy Spirit was still moving the same direction. He said, by this, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom they who believed in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Isn't that amazing? So, 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 so Jesus inferred that there would be a moving of the Spirit and that when you come to him. So Jesus said, I am sent. What was he saying? I am sent by the Father. I have a purpose. Out of my side will flow blood and water. It will burst forth. That's what he was really saying. And it will give you life. It will be living water. And it'll change who you are and how you think. Come unto me and drink. Right? So Jesus was referring there again to the baptism with the Holy Spirit that the disciples received on the day of Pentecost with the early rains and with that and with the harvest. So again, you got two harvests here, the harvest of Pentecost, the harvest of the Feast of Tabernacles. Both times, uh, the Bible refers to a moving of the Spirit. There was a moving of the Spirit when the church age began. That's the reason Jesus, I'll go to in a minute, Jesus told the disciples not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. Verse 5, Acts 1, for John truly baptized with water, You'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, when it occurred that very day, they were all together in the upper room. The Holy Spirit fell on them, and they were all baptized with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Isn't that something? Well, he said, don't leave Jerusalem until you got it. And they hung around and waited for 10 days till the Holy Spirit fell. Why did they not leave Jerusalem? Because they needed the water for the harvest. And what is God doing today? Well, here we are. We're, we're, that, that was the latter rains. Now we, we have the early rains here. And there is a moving of the Spirit that will come with the harvest of souls. That was at the beginning of the church age. Now there's a harvest of souls that, that, that God wants to come into the kingdom of God before Jesus comes back. You wonder why, why God delays His coming? First, uh, Second Peter 3, God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Why did He de- delay His coming? <laughs> He's wanting people to come to Him. So again... These rains, let's talk about the early and latter rain again. Let's talk about water. Let's talk about rain. The rains in the New Testament are associated with a moving of the Holy Spirit at the beginning and end of the church age. And listen to James 5, 7. It moves, puts it all together with the harvest, dear brothers and sisters. Be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. We just read about it. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. Then he refers that to the church age. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. What was the inference that James was making? You got to have rain before the harvest comes. And there's going to be a moving of the spirit before that final harvest of people into the kingdom of God. So let me take a break from this a minute and say this. What are you living for? Are you living to make money to grow a business? Are you living for love? Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Are you living to please yourself? Are you just living, so to speak, hand to mouth, just enjoying life, going day by day, not thinking about the future? If you are, you need to expand your vision a little bit. Jesus said, look up, the fields are white to harvest. He's not talking about wheat, not talking about olives. He's not talking about grapes. He's talking about people. There are people that are walking in darkness and they do not have the life of God. And in America today, there is a, there is an overflow of demon power. And you reckon, and, and what you notice and the way you know it's true, there is vitriol. That means bitterness. There are bitter words, bitter attitudes, bitter thoughts. Bitter behaviors, there's fighting, there's anger, there's animosity, there's loose living, there's sexual promiscuity. And the idea is, don't you tell me how to live. And it's all propagated by demon power. Demon powers want to take over the world through the Antichrist. 
A synonym for Antichrist would be the controller. Because he wants to control your money. He wants to control your behavior. He wants to tell you what you should look at, what you shouldn't look at, where you should be, what you should do. I'll just tell him where to go. Go to hell where you belong. That's really strong, I know, Lord. I hear you. How many hear me? If you modify your behavior because of the words, because of the angst, because of the pressure, you're yielding to the Spirit. There is another Spirit coming on the body of Christ. The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion, Proverbs 28, 1 says. There is a boldness coming. I feel it right now. There is a boldness coming on the body of Christ. I ought to obey God rather than man. I know you think that's true. I don't. I love you. I will never be involved in that. I know you say it's okay. God says it's not. You make a choice. Either you'll remain bound in that or you can be free. Come to the waters. How many hear me? So again, there's a much needed rain. So a tremendous crop can come in. How many get it? See, that's the way God's thinking about our day. He wants the body of Christ to open up to the rain. What is the rain? The moving of the Spirit. See, rain is a metaphor for a moving of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Amos 9, 13. The time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and the grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Then the terraced vineyards on the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine. There's coming a day when the, when the sower Overcomes the reaper. That's what it says in the King James verse. It's coming a day when the harvest is so plentiful you can't keep up. Now we're living, we're going into that day right now. You say, well, there's a lot of pressure today. I know pressure, the persecution produces purity. It produces a hunger. You're seeing that there's nothing, there's an inroad. There's nothing to the things of the flesh that people say can satisfy them. They are not satisfied. They'll never be be satisfied. The things of this life can never satisfy. They only bring bondage. And that's why the fields are white to harvest. And God wants us to let the water of the Spirit move through us so it can drench other people with the presence of God and they come to Jesus how many hear me again water and rain are a type of the Holy Spirit in the Bible and the prophet speaks of an outpouring of water just before Jesus returns Isaiah 44 3 I will pour out refreshing water on the thirsty and streams on dry ground isn't that good I will pour out my spirit on your children my blessings upon your descendants Isaiah 55 I love this verse Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, eat, come, buy wine, milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight itself in abundance. Jesus said the words that I speak unto you are spirit and life. Man will not live by bread alone. We have the bread of eternal life. And you know what? It's the water that will cause the wheat to grow that brings the bread. How many hear me? Joel 2.23, be glad then for you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully. And he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. God is saying here in Joel 2 again, there's coming a time of moving of the Spirit will be grander than it's ever been. And these two periods of rain will actually join together. It will be such a season of harvest, you can't tell one from the other and you can't hardly harvest. You can't hardly plant seed because the harvest is still moving and that's where we're going. How many hear me? So when's the last time you asked God, Lord, pour out your spirit on me in a fresh way. Zechariah 10.1, ask the Lord for rain. Listen, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will wait flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. When Susan and I first moved to uh, Tulsa in 1980, uh, Kenneth Hagin, they would have at Rama on their campus a, a prayer meeting at 6 o'clock on Sunday nights. 
And we uh, were in the process of figuring out our local church stuff. But uh, Sunday nights, when we first moved there, we remember so we would go to a prayer meeting they had on the Rama campus. And then uh, every day at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, they had a healing school that Kenneth Hagin started in 1979. He would teach on healing. They'd lay hands on the sick, and they would invite the infirm from all over the nation to come. At 1 o'clock, prior to that teaching time, they would have, um, they would have a prayer meeting. And so if I had a day off, I would go to the prayer meeting at 1 o'clock. Susan had to work. But I would go to the prayer meeting at 1. And Kenneth Hagin, when he was in town, he would lead these prayer meetings. He, he, he many times would lead the one Sunday nights, and then he would lead the prayer meeting during the week at 1 on the Rama campus. And, you know, there probably, I don't know, there wasn't a lot of people there, maybe 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 7,500 people there, because people are working and stuff. But the students would come when they could. So I remember going there and many times Brother Hagen would kneel down on a chair on the platform and he would be in to pray for the world. He would pray for the harvest and ask God for the harvest. And then he would quote this verse to the Lord, ask the Lord for rain. Zechariah 10 would ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. He said, Lord, let the rain come out here. I can still hear him. Lord, let the rain come. He started praying, Lord, let the rain come on Russia. Let the rain come on the nations in behind the Iron Curtain. Lord, let the rain come. Let the moving of the Spirit come through all the earth. And, and he prayed that for years. And then, you know, uh, the Berlin Wall fell in November of 1989. I had moved to South Carolina. When I saw that, my mind went back to these prayer meetings where, where Kenneth Hagin was praying. I know he's not the only one. Others were praying, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. Churches sprung up by the thousands all over Russia, all over Siberia. It spans 12 time zones, the Baltic states, great moving of the Spirit. Uh, Rick Renner moved uh, there not long after that, began his huge ministry all all over the former Soviet states, just tremendous. God began to do dramatic and amazing things. Evangel Fellowship International, of which I'm a part of. I'm actually a board member there. And the, uh, the person that founded that, Bishop Houston Miles, was instrumental in me coming here. He actually went there, founded, I don't know how, hundreds and hundreds of churches. There is a great moving of the Spirit. Kenneth Hagin prayed that, him and others, in the manifestation, asked the Lord for rain. And here the last years I've been praying, Lord, let the rain come. Let the rain come. Ask the Lord for rain. Would you lift your hands with me? Father, let the rain of your Spirit be poured out again. Lord, as it was in the, in, in the old days, let it come back again. We ask for rain, Lord, in the time of the latter rain. Lord, we're living in a nation that has become quite dry and parched, lifeless, unfruitful. Let the rain of your Spirit come once again. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Ezekiel saw, listen, they'll tie it together. Ezekiel saw, Ezekiel was praying one day. Ezekiel was a prophet. And Ezekiel saw the future rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. In my vision, the man, this is Ezekiel 48, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple passing to the right side of the altar on its south side. The man brought me outside to the north gate, led me around to the eastern entrance. I saw the whole thing. Then I could see water, what is it? Water flowing out through the south side of the east, east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet. That's almost six football fields in length. Think about it. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for six football fields and then led me across. The water was up to my ankles. Glory. He measured off another six football fields and led me across again. This time the water was up to my knees. And another six football fields, it was up to my waist. Then he measured another six football fields and the river was up too deep to walk across. It was d deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. So as he walked in the river of God, he's he saw the river of God. In Revelation 22, there's a river that flows from the throne of God and it flows into the new Jerusalem. It flows into the earth. And everywhere that river goes, everything is healed and renewed. 
And he said of this river that, that uh, Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 47, there will be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. F- fish will abound in the Dead Sea. Its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever the river flows. New King James says it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live. There'll be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there. For they will be healed and everything will live where the river flows. So you see, the Bible speaks in analogies and metaphors. And this is an analogy of the moving of the Spirit that's coming. And Jesus said, He that believes on me, as the Scriptures have said, out of his belly will burst forth torrents of living, living water. That living water, reference right here to Ezekiel 47. That living water is the presence of God. Uh, If you're born again, you have the presence of God. What are you doing with it? Are uh, Are you putting it in a cup and putting the top on it? You know, I got a little Yeti cup I like to drink out of. You know, you put that top on, it stays cold for a long time, right? Well, you got to take the top off and then you got to drink and then let other people drink too if you need to. My my little grandbabies, they'll try to get my little cup and drink out of it. I say, no, I don't want your spit. That river flowing out of us will minister life. How many hear me? Joel saw this revival, Joel 2.28, after doing all these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my uh, my spirit, even on servants, men and women alike, all ages, all, all of the strata of culture. And I will cause wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood, fire, columns of smoke, speaking probably of tumult, and confusion, perhaps war, when he talks about, uh, when he talks about blood, fire, columns of smoke, the sun will become dark, the moon will turn blood red before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. Now that's talking about that there we're right into the, the time of the Antichrist. Right after he desecrates the Jewish temple, the sun will darken a a little while after that. The moon will not give its light. Jesus will come back. The day of the Lord will begin in Revelation chapter 8. The whole earth is chaotic and we're going up in the rapture of the church. Are you excited about that? Before that happens, the Antichrist will appear. Now listen to me. There are a lot of people, you're going to see this on social media. You're going to see it on the internet a lot. People will start talking about the rapture of the church again. Because a lot of people have a belief system. I used to have that, that the rapture is going to occur before the Antichrist, before the Antichrist reveals himself. And so we won't even be here for all this madness and mess and billy who that will be happening. But the truth is, I believe, and I, you know, if I'm wrong on the way up, I'll say, I was wrong. And y'all can say, yay, you were wrong. But if I'm right, get ready. Because that's the era of time when this revival hits, when the rain falls. When the Holy Spirit's poured out on young and old and the Holy Spirit manifests himself, it's a time of difficulty and challenge. So listen, don't feel badly about 2021. I know we got crazy stuff going on in America. You know, it's okay. It's going to move people to God. I've seen it. This church will fill up with people who don't know what to do, don't know where to go, don't know what to think, don't have the answers. They've trusted politicians. They've trusted political parties and they've left them high and dry and they're looking for something that helps them. And we have not the water of the flesh. We have water for the soul. Come unto me. Come and drink. Come and eat. You who buy and sell, come and get that which is free. Jesus' blood paid for it for you. So I got a question for you. Are you full of the Spirit? Can I get more pointed? Have you received the baptism with the Holy Spirit? I was 17. I, three weeks later, I turned 18. And back up, I was 16. My mother received the baptism. I can be quick. I don't know how to be quick. <laughs> My mother received baptism in the Holy Spirit February of 1977. No, I'm sorry, 1975. I was 16. I graduated from high school when I was 16. I was 16. May, May that year I graduated. Just before I graduated, my mother received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a prayer meeting in a lady's home. And fell out under God's power on the the floor and said, what in the world happened to me? She came home praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues. And we're we're Southern Baptists. 
deacons come to visit, visit my daddy because my daddy's on the deacon board. So please sign this affidavit saying that you're, you disavow the experience your wife had. Now you got to know my daddy. I'm a chip off the old block. <laughs> if they come in the front door, nobody comes in the front door. Everybody comes in the side door at our house. They just come in the living room door. He opened that door. He said, well, hi, what y'all doing here? He said, we got an affidavit. Won't you to sign disavowing what happened to your wife? He looked at that paper. He took it. He looked at it. He looked at them. He looked at it again, looked at them. He said, you see that door you just come in? Go right out the same way with that paper. I'll never sign it. And he never did. Now, my daddy never, because he was died in the Wool Southern Baptist till he went to be with Jesus in 2012. But he couldn't deny that something happened to my mama. The next year, y'all, I received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I had problems with my flesh, honest. My flesh would whip me every day as a teenager. I'd get into dope and drugs and mess and stuff. God bless, help me, Jesus. I'm singing in the choir at church. I'm going to church three times a week full of the devil. You know, you can come to the church full of the devil. You, you can come to church and you're just a hypocrite. Some of you teenagers, you come in just because mom and daddy comes. Man, you're longing for the world, son. You're longing for something that will ruin your life. Most of my friends I did drugs with are dead. They never made it to their 60s. Because that stuff will kill you. Did you hear me? Or to maim you and mess you up. Where you have no quality of life. For me, as my year, so my strength will be. That's what I believe. You know what? It seems like I'm just waking up. It's like, Father God, I'm just growing up. Here we go. Because when the Holy Ghost comes inside, He changes who you are. I got a question. Are you born again, number one? When you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes inside. And He lives in you. But when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses for me, Acts 1-8, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Let me ask another question. If you have been in your past, are you like that man that Jesus said had some money and he dug a hole in the ground, put it in a bag, stuck it in the hole so people wouldn't steal it? He didn't even put it in the bank to earn interest. He can't earn interest today. They give you half a cent. Right? Are you full of the Holy Ghost? If you're full of the Holy Ghost, are you walking in the light of that experience? Are you praying in the Spirit every day? Every day I spend at least an hour praying in the Spirit. Most times more because I pray in the Spirit all day. You look at me, you stand, I'm up here singing, y'all singing, I'm praying in the Spirit. I'm just praying. Wow. I want to hear from God. It's a direct connection to God. You're praying the perfect will of God. Have you, are you baptized with the Holy Ghost? There comes with that a tremendous hunger. The day after I was filled with the Holy Spirit, September 13th, 1976, I went to work. I worked 10 hours that day. And I promise you, I went to my room after I was still living with my mom and dad. I was 17. <laughs> I, 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 we didn't even, I think, yeah, we didn't even have a, she had just got a microwave, but we still, uh, I, they put my dinner in, in, a, in a little oven on the counter. Heated that thing up. I ate my dinner, went back to my room. And I said, oh, something's wrong with me. I'm 17. Something's wrong with me, I thought. Something's wrong. And I, I just wanted to, I wanted to read my Bible. And I even looked at it and said, you know, if I could, I'd eat this thing. I'm so, so hungry. I'd never been so hungry for the Bible. I've been in the Bible all my life. Stars on my head for memorizing verses. But something's different. It feeds my soul. And I can't do without it. And it took away the hunger for junk. If you got a hunger for the sweets of the world, it's because you've never really tasted living bread. Amen.